Let's talk about sea elegants. Um, these are a worm that are used um, for development for a lot of reasons. Number one, we can trace every cell. And I say, I mean every cell. We know exactly how many cells are going to be in the hermaphrodite. There are some cases where there are not some hermaphrodite uh, C. elegans where they have over 1,000. But the hermaphrodite C. elegans have 959 cells every time. Okay? We can trace the lineage of every single cell, where it's going, what it becomes. It was one of the first organisms that we were able to do a um, uh, the gene or sequence the entire genome. This was done while we were doing the human genome sequence for 10 years. This was completed before the human genome sequence. We were able to sequence this. And the reason for that is because they only have about 3% of the DNA that we have in terms of the amount. So it, it was a lot less to sequence. Although they have almost the same number of genes that you and I have. They have about 18 to 20,000 genes. We have 20 to 25,000 genes. And a lot of that comes into their regulation of their genes. As we talked about uh, uh, alternate splicing of our genes, that's what makes us so different, amongst many other things. But one of the big things is that we can splice our genome so many different ways. They have very few splice variants uh, of their genes. So they're very simple organisms to study because there's not a lot of complexity in how they make their proteins. So we've sequenced all of their genome. We know all the ins and outs of their genes. Um, again, the, one of the advantages is being able to study them in a laboratory, being able to do fertilization and development in laboratory conditions. These we can continue from one generation to the next. Due to the fact that they're hermaphroditic, they self-fertilize. They produce both sperm and egg, which means that they, it, they do undergo meiosis. They do produce both sperm and egg, and they can undergo this meiotic process. I mean, plants are hermaphroditic, so it's not any different than a plant self-pollinizing because it produces both sperm and egg. So these C. elegans, uh, it's just odd because these are one of the few animals that are truly hermaphroditic in the sense that they can produce both sperm and egg uh, in the same organism. So 959 cells. We know exactly how many. Uh, and then, again, the eggs are transparent. So we can watch these embryos develop from fertilization all the way to the end. And it only takes 16 hours for their entire embryogenesis process. Very rapid turnover to be able to have these things develop. Okay? They're one of the faster organisms in which development occurs. So they're, they're used quite often because of the rapidity in which we can undergo this developmental process and be able to observe it. They've been able to do uh, fate mapping for pretty much all the cells. They've been able to trace the lineage of every cell due to a variety of different fate mapping techniques between dyes and fluorescence and things of that sort. So we know quite a bit about the development of C. elegans. There's still a lot to learn, but a lot of the mechanisms that are found in C. elegans are translatable to understanding other organisms, including ourselves, which is why they're a good model organism to use. So these are a lot of the advantages. We can trace every cell line. Even though we can watch sea urchins, we can't, I don't know whether they've traced every single cell, but they have uh, for C. elegans. So, Here's some of the anatomy of the C. elegans. They'll produce in one area the oocytes, in another area they'll, they'll produce the sperm. So they are hermaphroditic in that they produce both types of gametes. Let's look at the initial stages. These are fer fairly fascinating. Now they are holoblastic, like sea urchins in their cleavage process, in that the entire oocyte undergoes cleavage. You don't have any part of it that's not undergoing cleavage. Rotational. This plays a key role, especially in the initial specification process. So one thing about the C. elegans is the initial oocyte doesn't have any polarity to it. In fact, the maternal components um, are spread out pretty much evenly throughout the entire oocyte, at least some of the ones that matter. 
So the question becomes, how does it start forming the axes, the anterior and the posterior axes? Well, the sperm can enter in pretty much any place it wants to. When the sperm enters in, that will become the posterior end of the C. elegans. So wherever the sperm fertilizes, that's where the posterior end is going to be. What happens is the cytoskeleton will move it and push it to one end. So let's say it, it fertilizes right up here, then it will move that nuclei down to this region right here, and that becomes the posterior region where it will fuse with the oocyte nuclei. So how does it determine that the, where the sperm uh, um, enters into, it's pulled to the closest end of the oocyte, fuses with the nuclei, and that will form the posterior end. How does that happen? What will, what will happen is it starts causing the cytoskeleton to create these movements of the, uh, uh, of the cytoplasm that will push proteins, maternal components, all to the other end of the oocyte. Okay, so when the sperm pronucleus enters into uh, the uh, um, oocyte, it causes a reaction in the cytoskeleton that will actually start pushing. Now remember, we talked in the beginning about how one of the ways in which you can asymmetrically distribute molecules is through the cytoskeleton, and this is one of the ways. The cytoskeleton will actually push a bunch of these proteins to one side of the oocyte pretty much clearing this side of certain uh, factors. And this is what will become the posterior end. Eventually, these nuclei will fuse together. Cytokinesis will occur after mitosis. And the anterior cell will become most of the embryo itself. The posterior cell becomes the germline cells. So these cells right here, these P cells, if you look at a fate map, they're purple. Remember, purple means germline cells. So these, and here's where things get a little crazy. These germline cells are under complete autonomous specification. They now have the proteins that they need and the mRNA and, and all the factors that they need to differentiate into the germline cells. And this will eventually become the oocyte and the sperm in the hermaphroditic adult. The other cell. These, this other cell right here, that is, and its subsequent cells are under conditional specification. So again, we have two separate types of specification in the same organism, where these cells under a complete autonomous specification, the germline cells, and these other cells are under conditional specification. So what happens after that first cleavage? So once the sperm enters into it and causes the cytoskeleton to push a bunch of these maternal components. I'm not even going to, I mean, the book talks about PAR, you know, these PAR elements and, and whatnot. I'm not going to, we don't need to really get into the dynamics. That's graduate work to get into the, the names of all of these proteins. On occasion, I'll mention some proteins if they really matter, um, but most of the time we're just going to look at the mechanics of what's going, going on here. Because honestly, if we went through every stupid protein, your head would explode. Um, mine did during my PhD, so um, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to stress you out more than you have to. Now, we don't know all of the factors involved, but we do know that if you remove these cells, like through an isolation experiment, that because they're not adjacent to other cells, they will not take on the face that they should. So we know that they must interact with certain cells in order for the embryo to pattern itself. We may not know all the reasons why, but we do know that they are required because of the various isolation experiments that have been done where they will remove this cell and they'll see what happens as a result. Now, this is called rotational holoblastic cleavage, and that actually plays a big role in its axis specification. Because what happens is as the cells start undergoing mitosis, the the blastocyst starts elongating, and as the cells undergo rotational cleavage, they start shifting in such a way that you start creating the dorsal ventral axis and the left-right axis. So here's what we know about these initial stages of cleavage. When the AB cell here undergoes rotational cleavage, so what happens is the mitotic spindle shifts, 
and it undergoes cleavage uh, um, along a different axis. Then the one more anteriorly and the one more posteriorly, the posterior one gets kind of pushed up and that becomes the dorsal region. So this ABP uh, cell will be in the dorsal end of the C. elegans. Whereas these cells on, on down here that come from these cells right here, again, when this cell, when the P cell splits off, it takes with it what it needs to become the germline, and the remaining cytoplasm doesn't have any of those maternal components. And that becomes what we call the EMS cell. This is going to become the mesoderm and the endoderm, this region right here, this cell. These cells right here primarily become ectoderm, although there are some mesoderm in there as well. So here's kind of what happens. The AB cell will split and continue to split. Most of the AB cells become the ectoderm. The EMS cell, this one cell, as it splits, will become both the mesoderm and the endoderm. Some further cells that split from these don't get these autonomous components. So you can see how the P-line cells these are under autonomous specification. It pretty much says, this is what I need to become the germline, you get the rest, you know, and, it, and as those cells divide off from it, they'll take on various fates depending upon the interactions with all these other cells, okay? So let me simplify this for you. The AB cell, the first cell that's more anterior is under conditional specification. The germline cells, are under autonomous specification. Even after the first cell division, they've already determined what they're gonna become. Now, let's look at the axes. The anterior posterior axis of the C. elegans is primarily determined by where the sperm enters in. The initial setting up of the oocyte does not have an anterior posterior axis, not like the sea uh, urchin, where the animal pole is the anterior axis, and the vegetal pole is the posterior axis. That's already predetermined by the distribution of maternal components and the yolk. Dorsal ventral axis. This is predetermined by the rotational cleavage. As the AB cell rotates and cleaves, the one that's a little more posterior, that's where ABP comes into play, the P is posterior, and the interaction between the EMS cell that is, uh, uh, comes off from the, one of the germline cells that creates the dorsal ventral. So this APB uh, cell, a ABP cell is the dorsal side and the EMS is the ventral side. The left-right axis comes about a little bit later on when the EMS cell splits and it interacts with the anterior AB cell. And we're not gonna get into the dynamics of how all that's done, but I do want you to know that in the earliest stages, only after a couple of cell divisions, already, you've patterned the anterior posterior axis, dorsal ventral axis, and the left right hemispheres of the C. elegans. This is earlier than most organisms do it uh, in, ter in terms of its patterning. So we don't know all the reasons on why the interaction between these two cells create the dorsal ventral axis, but we do know that it is required due to isolation experiments where we've taken the cell out and seen what happens and you don't get dorsal ventral axis. You don't get these cells becoming